Good afternoon and welcome to Out at Work panel for Lesbian Visibility Week, um, which is being hosted by Diva. Uh, my name is Chloe Davies and I'm Head of PR and Partnerships for my G-Work, online business community for LGBT students, graduates, organisations who truly believe in workplace quality. I'm very excited to host this panel today. I'm joined by some truly amazing women. Uh, starting us off, Claire, would you like to tell everyone who you are? Yes, hi everyone. My name's Claire Skinner. I'm Head of Content and Delivery uh, at the Producery Management Business at Mercer, but much more interestingly, I'm Global Chair of our LGBT network, which is imaginatively called Mercer Pride. Fantastic. And Tolu? Hi everyone. My name is Tolu Osanubi and I work for Deloitte in the tech management practice and I'm a manager within that. And so I'm very active within our LGBTQI network called GLOBE, particularly in the event space. And I also work a lot with the Black Professionals Network. Fantastic. TJ? Hi, I'm TJ Richards and I work at Santander. Um, I'm a PMO and stakeholder outreach manager, which sounds boring, but it is super fun. Um, and I also am the national co-chair for the LGBTQ plus network at Santander called Embrace. Fantastic. Annie? Hi, I'm Annie Newman. I work at GSK as the senior digital content editor in the comms and government affairs function. In addition to that, I lead Spectrum, which is GSK's LGBT and our network, and I'm the comms and engagement co-lead for the Proud Science Alliance. Fantastic. And lastly, Arlene. Hi, I'm Arlene McDermott. I uh, work in the London Stock Exchange Group as a portfolio director. So I oversee lots and lots of projects. It's not boring, it's great fun. Uh, and I'm also co-chair of the group's LGBT plus network called Proud. Fantastic. And um, so as you are the last of Ollie, I'm gonna ask you first, uh, how do you identify and at what point in your career did you come out at work? I, I don't think I ever made a conscious decision that like when I came out, uh, that I was going to do that same kind of, you know, big newscast on coming out as being gay in work. I think in my early career, I was moving from Ireland where, you know, it had only, I think, only become legal and decriminalised in 1993, um, which was about when I moved to London. And um, yeah, I think I was cagey around it then. But I also worked as a consultant across lots of different organisations. So like in the voluntary sector, in government and so on. And so even then, there was a lot of people who were openly out and I think then when I went into institutions and organizations that were that you know were, were less out or appeared that people were not really out in those environments I kind of had gotten comfortable elsewhere and I sort of brought that comfort with me and um, so I so I never really made that conscious decision it was just some people would know probably would guess and um, yeah I've always been really open and I'm really passionate about people being open at work I've you know I've always been I've also been really supportive by my family uh, when I came out so you know I'm shocked when anybody has an issue really Some Tolly, yeah, <laughs> over to you uh, thank you uh, so I've always been out um, at the, from the very start of my career for me and it felt like one of the few places that I had control over and I could come out on my own terms. Mm -hmm. As for me, my experience of coming out uh, to my family was a much harder and longer process. So um, in the work environment, it felt very much more a place I felt I could be open and be who I was. Yeah. Annie, how, how was it for you? Um, I think I've been at GSK for more years than I want to uh, kind of say, but for most of my career. Um, and I came out midway through my time at GSK. Nothing to do with GSK itself. It is very supportive. I just had my own internalized fears of what I thought was going to happen and what I thought people would say. And I let that kind of get in the way. Um, but when I kind of linked in with our LGBT network spectrum um, and I got supported and I got to talk to people and I kind of worked out well actually there's this great community there to support me so if the worst happens I know I've got some people and friends um, and since I've come out um, it's been really brilliant at work and I'm really 
pleased that my family are also supportive. Um, they were a bit taken aback after I think I was like 30 or something when I came out, but they've been brilliant. Fantastic. Um, TJ, and I guess um, as we're going and we're talking about these coming out stories, but if you would tell everybody is listening, if you feel comfortable, how it is that you do identify. So I think that we kind of just briefly skipped, skipped that part. Yeah, um, I identify as a, a lesbian. Um, probably more often than not, I, I refer to myself as a, a gay woman. Um, not any particular reason, I just prefer the term, I guess, but I, I'm comfortable with both. Um, in terms of coming out at work, uh, yeah, that, that was a, an experience. Um, I was actually outed at work, um, and I, I'm an American, so I was in the, the American military at the time, um, under don't ask, don't tell. So it was completely okay for me to be gay as long as nobody on earth knew about it, um, which made dating difficult. Um, but I was stationed here in the UK. I had a, a British girlfriend um, and I was living a double life and it was really difficult. So, so difficult and exhausting. Um, and eventually I got outed um, and it was, I had, a, I had an option to fight it, I guess, to, to pretend like I wasn't gay. Um, but, and, and you know, and I could have stayed in the military because um, my career was on the line at that point, but it it really wasn't a choice. Um, you know, I was I was in love, and I wasn't gonna hide that for any close-minded employer. Um, so I knew it was time for me to say farewell to the military. Um, I unceremoniously left um, in 2005, I guess. Now, yeah, 2005. Mm -hmm. uh, my girlfriend and I have been got married. We've been together 17 years now. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a, a, a good experience. Um, and I ended up landing at Santander, which was um, not the career I'd originally planned on, um, but turned out to be a great, a great decision because I love it at Santander, you know, really, really well supported. I'm able to, com to be completely out. I constantly refer to Tony as my wife this, my wife that, and people often wonder if she actually has a name. <laughs> um, but I just love being able to say my wife. Like, I think I never expected to be able to do that. So I get really excited about it. Um, and, and she's, she's much more calm about the whole situation. So I'm, I'm more like the, the Jack Russell terrier jumping around all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And finally, Claire. Um, so I've worked at Mercer, um, most of my career um, from way back in the 90s and, and when I first started I was kind of softly out so I'd bring my partner to work events etc but I was never kind of um, you know out out um, and then about five or six years ago I, I left Mercer to um, train as a teacher and, and while I was teaching um, I had uh, well kind of my first instances of really kind of homophobia really from the from the kids um, which was quite um, surprising because when you know when I was at work everyone had been pretty supportive they were a little bit surprised when I got pregnant and that and, and, a, and a few intrusive questions about how that happened but other than that people had been pretty good um but um but yeah I had this these kind of experiences teaching and and um and, and perhaps not surprisingly left teaching and went back to Mercer but when I went back I thought right you know now um I want to be kind of out out I want to be that kind of role model I'm in a kind of relatively senior position so I felt quite secure in doing that and, and you know literally sort of sent an email around the business and then got involved with the sort of fledgling at that point LGBT network and um, and um, yeah um, I'm kind of very gay at work now. <laughs> I, I think it's that um, when you are supported especially when you're supported by an employer who is truly inclusive of our LGBT identity that idea that we can freely be our whole self at work and kind of celebrate and the talk and, and how and how we are um, is really, really empowering. Tolo you spoke about the difficulties of perhaps coming out with your family and the knock-on effect that that had had in comparison to making the decision to be out at work and like you said something that you could very much control and kind of decide as and when I'm going to be fully me or, or the parts of ourselves that we have to edit. How, how was that decision in coming out at work? Was that very much a from the beginning, this is me, take it or leave it, or kind of that softly diagnosis as you did, as you did with your family of the parts of 
you know, this is where I'm finally ready to say or to not say, as, as many of you have mentioned about having to hide part, certain elements, where was that in your career journey? And, and has it impacted on your career in any way of not being so out or being out and the repercussions? So I think that very much for me, it was, I, I made a decision not to hide or omit my sexuality uh, with, in a work environment because I think that was what was happening continuously and um, within my family and those circles. And I felt that I spent so much time at work that I need to be, I need to be myself. And the process at work, it felt very natural as well because I was very, it, I've always felt um, at Deloitte very supported and um, colleagues have been nothing other than amazing uh, so um, that's something that really helped the process and made it very natural for me so I would say that I've been I've been very fortunate that it hasn't affected my career um, so far and in tech consulting we usually spend so, so quite a lot of long hours on projects and that means you get to know your team and people quite well. So you end up talking about each other's lives and partners. And I've always been really open about my, my other half. And we always put, and I always make um, a real uh, commitment to talk about what I'm doing outside of work. And if we're going away so that it's very much um, a natural conversation. And uh, this uh, towards the uh, end of the last year as well, um, when my fiance, yeah, we got engaged. Oh, so thank you very much. So, uh, all my colleagues at work that I was working on a project with, uh, they got as a nice bottle of champagne and a lovely card that everybody signed. So that was really, really lovely. Great, that's fantastic. That's really nice. Annie, what about you? Um, so I don't think LGBT has affected my career at all, other than um, I think it affected my early career, but only because of my internal fears made me have a lack of confidence so I wouldn't put myself forward for things because I was overthinking exactly what if someone found out and what would happen um, and it also affected my mental health early on as well but since I've been out I think it's opened a whole new avenue and opportunities for me not only kind of leading spectrum but looking at how I can through my role in communications kind of tell the amazing stories of people around GSK and what we're doing so I think in that way it's been a real positive and I've met great people and managed to do amazing things just being part of that network. Fantastic. Arlene? Um, when I read this question I think my first reaction was I have no idea if it affects. I don't know if people were, <laughs> were saying you know not hiring her she's okay I don't know I don't think it has but I you know again I think we're all probably you know comfortable with who we are now and we're out and you know leading on kind of major LGBT initiatives within pretty big organizations right and um, I think uh, I think it does affect people I think a lot of people do feel isolated and I think that they do feel that they are not like you've said able to go forward for you know particular positions because they you know they're and, and not having people to talk to I think it's just really important that we're we constantly keep reminding our organizations that it's great to be out it's okay to be out so that people know about us you know um because I know you know early in my career there wasn't LGBT plus networks you know we weren't it was just the power of people being out that allowed others to feel that it was okay to get. And that's why these networks I feel are really, are really, really important because while we may be given, you know, a view that actually, yeah, it's been fine. It's not for everybody. You know, I think it's important that we remember that. And that's why what we're doing here and what Lesbian Visibility Week is about, is about really shouting from the rooftops that, you know, it's a really powerful thing to be yourself within the workplace. TJ, what about you? Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly ended my career at the time. <laughs> um, but, you know, I like to think of that as their loss. Uh, Absolutely. But, um, Absolutely. yeah, I mean, I had, I had the choice to admit it um, or fight it. And, it, it, you know, like I said, it was a really easy choice in the end um, because I knew what I wanted in life. Like, all of a sudden, I think before I struggled with, you know, the, the, dual, the dual lives and having to you know, gender neutral conversations and, mm. you know, oh, my, my partner, this, my other half, that, 
Um, and yeah, in America, we don't say partner unless you're talking about like cowboys, really. So it, it would always come across as awkward when I tried to do it. Um, but it was really freeing, you know, to be able to to just be myself and not have to worry about it. And I think that that in itself definitely had an impact on, you know, my my new career that I ended up in. Because all of a sudden I was able to not edit myself, you know, not have to hide bits of myself um, and just be me, you know, all, all the bits um, like that could be awkward, but you know, the, the bits I can take out in public, um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it definitely made a difference. Um, and now, you know, I would have never thought 20 years ago that I'd be leading, you know, a nationwide network of, of LGBTQ plus people. I never thought that I'd be, you know, taking part in all of these, these opportunities and meeting all these wonderful people and, and hearing all these stories of what other people have, you know, achieved and accomplished. Um, you know, none of that would have been possible had I not made that decision years ago. Um, so yeah, it was a rough decision at the time. It was a rough time in my life, um, but it ended up being the best, the best decision ever. And, and I, yeah, I don't regret it for a moment. Claire. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, certainly at Mercer, I would say it's a, it, it has been a positive advantage in, in that, um, you know, I get access to, you know, senior leaders globally that I just would not be talking to if I didn't have my role as part of the Pride Network. Um, you know, so that's, that, that's a real positive. But I, I think what's interesting, I mean, we talk a lot about um, people bringing their whole selves to work and we actually, um, you know, consult on that in terms of talking to other businesses about, you know how it's um, it's good for business to for people to be able to bring their whole selves to work. Um, you know, improve, improves productivity, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think one of the things that I really kind of working on is actually people understanding that that can be very difficult. Um, and I think it's often said without thinking about how hard it can be for somebody who might be in our Dubai office or our China office or our even. Um, Poland or you know lots of lots of places where it can be very difficult to to bring your whole self to work and so I think there's that real kind of education piece about um, um, yeah people understanding um, wherever you happen to be based on whatever your circumstances are um, it can be very difficult for whatever reason whether it's LGBT or or actually whether you're like me and quite enjoying being at home because you're an, an introvert and don't like socializing with people or, or whatever it is about your personality which might not fit with that kind of corporate image if you like yeah i'm um, completely you know you have two small children so working from home is um is a challenge you know when we when we think about and especially you know you work for five very large organizations you know that all have some really amazing lgbtqi networks within those networks what percentage would you say are uh, lgbtqi women um and do you think that enough is being done to support those women um being out being out within the workplace and within the network um so annie i'll, I'll start with you you know what what is spectrum doing for for us um well first off we don't ask people to disclose mm -hmm. when they they join the network so i don't have a, an exact percentage mm -hmm. but i would say that it's a fraction of of women against the amount of men that are in the network um, but what we're doing is um, I became lead of the network last year um, and being a lesbian myself I was 100% convinced that we needed to do more um, which started with look at making sure there were people on in my team who would represent and reflect back to our members the bi agenda the lesbian agenda the transgender agenda um, to make sure that they were really focused on what we could do there um, and then thankfully um, we've started a great relationship with Diva magazine which got us involved in uh, lesbian visibility week which I think is such an amazing event to be a part of um, and the content that's coming out from this event we are sharing um, internally with our members who are really really loving it um, and are sharing their own stories as well at the same time so they're seeing this as a kind of a kickstarter mm. um, to that and I think what's really important is being in spectrum we have a, a duty to be a role model whether we like it or not we need to be out there telling our stories um, we need to be out there 
getting people within the organization who identify as lesbian to come and tell their stories as well so that um, lesbians who maybe haven't come out or are early on in their career are seeing um, that you can go anywhere you want in this company you can be anyone you want to be it doesn't hinder anything and, and I'm really proud that we came um, six on the Stonewall Quality Index in the UK um, and you know a lot of that was around what we've been doing with uh, the kind of lesbian agenda as well so it's really kind of putting proof in the pudding that we are you know doing what we say we're going to do and I hope that that helps support a lot of people as well. Fantastic. Uh, TJ you know there there's so much that Santander is doing in terms of ERGs you know how how's the split there? Um, well, I mean, it's definitely smaller than I'd like, uh, given that women are 50% of the world population. I'd love it if lesbians were 50% of the network. <laughs> um, they're, they're not. Spoiler alert. Um, we do ask people, um, if they volunteer the information, um, how they identify when they join the network. But of course, we're aware that, you know, sexuality and, and sexual identity is fluid throughout people's lives. Um, so, you know, if we exclude the, the massive number of, of amazing allies that we have within the network, I think, I think lesbians make up something around 18% of, of our network. Um, but you can, you know, it's a small group, but I can guarantee you we are a very determined group um, and we, we punch above our weight. Um, so, so we're doing all right there. Um, and, you know, we do try to make sure that we're, we're meeting the needs of, of the women within our network. Um, and whether that's through, you know, raising awareness about things um, that, that may sometimes get, um, you know, sort of shoehorned into to other diversity threads, um, you know, information about adoption, fertility treatments, um, but also, you know, career, career progression um, and networking and helping each other and, you know, lifting each other up, um, busting down any, any glass ceilings that we find in our paths. Um, but it's led us to some really great uh, partnerships um, and, and work with, with other organizations such as My G Work and Diva Magazine and uh, Involve. We were, we were involved in their um, LB Women's Survey uh, last year, which was a really eye-opening experience for us. And, you know, we spend a lot of time asking our members, what, what, what can we do to support you? And sometimes that's quite a, uh, a reflective question, you know, people it's not something you can answer easily it's something you have to think about and really put some thought into um so you know we, we try to make sure that we're, we're as adaptive as possible to what the needs of of the population are um and just take it from there really uh, well, um, how have you found at mercer being uh, i guess starting taking a break and then coming back has there was there a shift when you came back uh, yeah, well, when I left, um, we didn't even have an LGBT network, so um, it was only just starting um, about six or seven years ago when I when I came back. So, yeah, I mean, we don't collect any data on um, sexuality or, or gender beyond um, the binary um, across Mercer at the moment, apart from in the states. Um, and actually, one of the things that we're we're trying to kick off with the Pride Network globally is to, is to look to collect that data because you know, one of the first things that, that we talk about when we're talking to clients about how to improve diversity and inclusion in, in general is you need to have the data, you need to know what your what your issues are before you can look at managing those issues. Um, and so we, we do have a project that we're kicking off at the moment to look to see whether we can expand the data, um, not just for the, 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 the pride group, but across the population um, around all of the kind of protected characteristics so that we could see See what our population is and also to see you know what particular issues um impact on that population you know mental health etc cetera, etc cetera. um so yeah we don't have that information but but at work you know financial services i'm often the only woman in the room so uh, i can pretty much guarantee um that uh, uh, lgbt women are a significant minority in the uh, in the lgbt group and we're yeah similar to, to TJ looking at ways that we can try and engage everybody in that group and I think there is a a double bind for women you know you're you're in a you're in a minority as a woman do you want to put yourself out in a further minority um because of your LGBT status, status as well I think that and I think that can put people you know further into the closet. Tolly um, what are, what about at Deloitte? 
And so I think similarly, uh, the Globe Network, we don't collect data on uh, on that in the same way. So I can't, I can't, I can't give an exact number, but I'd, I'd say confidently it's smaller uh, in terms of the representation. But one of the things that we've really looked to do is um, make sure that we're we're creating, you know, working groups that are focusing on um, certain issues. So, for example, LGBTQI women, and one of one of the uh, initiatives was to look at the events and the ways that we could we could, um, you know, be more involved and amplify um, LGBTQI women more. And one of the ways was obviously getting involved in um, Lesbian Visibility Week and looking at ways that we can really uh, give a platform to LGBTQI women so that we have more like visible role models, particularly mm -hmm. at the senior levels as well, because I think that is so important um, to have. Uh, so I think uh, for a uh, for, for us as a, as a firm, that's something that's very much evolving and there's definitely plenty of room for improvement. But I think the fact that we're, you know, focusing mm -hmm. on it and looking at how we can, you know, drive this forward is a really positive step. Fantastic. And finally, Arlene, you know, having listened to you speak passionately um, about what you're doing at the London Stock Exchange, you know, what, 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 is, what is working over there? I think, so... I think we probably take a bit more of a kind of big bang approach to the way we support our community. So first of all, we don't have a notion of joining the network. Mm -hmm. You're, you know, everybody is a member of our network. So, you know, we have people who ask to be specifically contacted about things, but we also have like an open teams channel that anybody can join. Um, so people will come along, they'll see what's going on. You know, we're pumping information about this week um, in there. Um, obviously, you know, as co-chair, so my, my co-chair is, is, a, is a gay man. Um, so we're kind of showing balance there really. But when we had uh, recently, so we've partnered with Pride in the City um, and we recently hosted uh, what we call a market close, which is where they kind of close the market. So it's really exciting. Um, and, you know, we are seven floors in that building with this kind of huge glass atrium. And every single floor, people were looking down, yeah, into at what was going on. And there's this very famous cube in the middle of the stock exchange foyer, which you may, may, may not have seen, it's a bit like the Scotland Yard cube kind of thing. That was awash with rainbow, you know, it was really fantastic. And so what we're really doing is just really punching through and bringing a huge voice to our community through our voice, you know? Um, and, you know, we have huge support from senior management um, we had on the balcony, most of our executive committee were there, you know, really celebrating with us. And I think that's what's really important for us right now is, you know, is to, is to just be really loud about the fact that our senior management 100% support us. So I've been approached by women in the organisation who've asked me to go for a coffee or breakfast not really knowing why, to be honest. And, uh, you know, and I've gone along and they're, they're, they're asking me, do I think it's okay if they come out? And I'm like, did you see what we just did? Of course it is. And then those people arrive at our events and they have a fantastic time. And, you know, so, so what we're doing is we're just being really loud about it and, you know, saying it's absolutely great. We welcome it. We don't want a, I think somebody said earlier about productivity and so on. We don't want, un, we don't want a filtered version of people coming to the workplace. And that's, that's no matter what, that's whether it's your sexuality, whether it's your background, whether it's a cultural difference that you might perceive. And I think perception is, is a big part of that, where we don't want you to filter yourself, you know, come to work fully whole as yourself because, you know, we get a better version of you at work as a result and that's had a huge it's had a huge impact uh, across the organization internationally actually i think so um yeah there's almost there's a rainbow on our intranet page most days it's great i think it very much comes back to like you said it's it's amazing when you know that you have at all levels but very much starting from the top back down and and, and back the way up and and i was at that event and it was incredibly impressive you know i was i was watching the countdown but also then i kind of got lost on 
every single floor you were seeing people come and look and it felt like they were a part of the celebration and I'm sure yeah. they would have asked lots of people afterwards so I think that when you do have businesses who are supporting what you know the great works that the networks are doing and it's really engaging in through the entire business um, it doesn't just feel like an ERG it feels like you know your your whole kind of business team and that sense of community yeah. within a community yeah. Sticking with you, Arlene, and actually in celebration, uh, you have just been named in Guardian's Visible 100 Lesbians. Congratulations on the list. Thank you. Um, how do you feel? <laughs> how, how, how does that feel? It's my, you know, my everything. phone. Looks yeah, everything has been just a phone buzzing constantly. And you know what I really loved about it? Because it's not, it's not about me. It's about being able to lend the Stock Exchange Group um, logo to the lesbian visibility week has also been brilliant as a supporting partner um but what was great was that my that the the london stock exchange group twitter feed also published the fact that it had happened mm -hmm. that's what's really special about it is that anybody who saw that from my group can see how much support we have within the group you know so that was the thing that i found most exciting was not just the fact that it was about me but all the support that i got personally but also public support from the london stock exchange group that was that was super special really really special and continues to be Oh, yeah it's really great thanks yeah. no congratulations again it was um I, you know i think all of us were kind of really looking forward to seeing what it looked like and uh kate yeah. the artist who's done the most amazing caricatures of the 100 like it's so it's like i'm waiting to get my hands on a copy because i think that it's yeah. really really beautiful uh tj you know when we are talking about you know out women within businesses at santander do you, you know are there senior uh, women at the senior level that are out um and 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 if so, I guess not being too specific because you know we don't we don't want to overshare. Um, but but in terms of representation, when you where you work, um, where do you think that the split is? Yeah, I'm, it's difficult. I mean, we we do have um, senior lesbians within the business. I think in the in the finance sector, um, probably like like many other sectors, um, the the number of women full stop. Um, in senior leadership positions is, is smaller uh, than, than I'd like it to be. Um, and then within that subset, the number of, of those senior women um, who are lesbians is even smaller. Um, so there are a couple um, at Santander and, and I really hope um, that, you know, as we continue to move forward on our, on our journey, really, towards inclusion and diversity across the bank um, and across the, the global bank, um, that, that more women are more comfortable to come out because, you know, statistically they're out there. They just, I just need to keep telling them, you know, come on, it's safe. It's fine. Come out. Mm -hmm. And I think the more we do that, the more, you know, like you said, Arlene, the more you'll get, you know, a, a, a random coffee invite to say, oh, mm -hmm. do you think, do you think I should? Um, and the answer to that is always absolutely, you know, be, be you. Um, you're never going to get as far in life as you would by being yourself. Um, and initiatives like Lesbian Visibility Week are a ginormous part of that um, and a really huge step forward. So we're really excited about it. Fantastic. Uh, Tolu, back over to you. You know, when we look at some of the networks that you have within Deloitte, you know, do you feel that they all support each other and share best practice and, and maybe um, tell everyone the different networks that you may have? You know, you talked about the LGBT network, but also being part of the ethnicity race network as well. Um, yeah, uh, so I think I think there are people uh, in Deloitte like myself have multiple intersectionality, which kind of automatically brings a lot of connection within yeah. the various networks. So for me, I identify as a black gay woman and all those parts of me are equally important to me because that makes me who I am. And uh, that that is just so, so important to me. So, for example, I'm involved with, and um, so I talked about the Globe Network, which is the LGBTQI network, but also women in technology as well, and also the Black Professionals Network. And in terms of your um, the question around how they interact and support each other, I think because there are those um, natural connections, that so um, recently during International Women's Day, a group of representatives um, from like the Women in Technology Network and the Black uh, 
professionals network was supporting um, the event and planned it um, together with the aim of just bringing diver a diverse range of voices and perspectives from a broad range of women, which I thought was really powerful. And just to see a real, um, just a real broad um, spectrum of people and speakers, which I think was a really awesome event earlier in the year. And I think the other networks as well during that were sharing those events and um, amplifying them but I would say that there's 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 room for improvement as well, and what that's something that we're really collectively trying to drive for. So um, this year, uh, through um, Globe and the Black Professionals Network um, working together, we were looking at ways that we could have some involvement. For example, in UK Black Pride, and mm -hmm. and, and I think things like that will really continue to solidify that and help us support each other more. So I think I think it's definitely work in progress. Absolutely. Um, and uh, as we're speaking, I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw in a couple of questions that we haven't been briefed on, but I think everyone will, will cover um, because we've been talking about it collectively. But I guess I want to ask everyone, you know, we're in a time of, and I hate using this word, but I think that it's actually about the only one that really covers it, that we are in unprecedented times, especially with COVID-19. Um, and so do you think that this will affect the growth of the LGBTQI networks where you work at work? And do you think that LGBTQ equality will start to take a back seat with more pressing concerns post COVID-19 after lockdown, such as economic downturn, or also how we just think about, you know, well-being of people and that overstimulation of actually being around people um, when we come out, um, when, we, when we come out of this. So I guess, Claire, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like, like, like every business, Mercer's not immune, um, clearly, to, to, to what's happening um, in the world at the moment. And, you know, that includes looking at, at, at budgets and spending. And so the first thing to go is things like the, um, the budgets for, for things like the business resource groups, which are kind of discretionary. Um, so we're kind of seeing that already. But, 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 I mean, we get such a tiny budget, it doesn't really make that much difference. And, and actually what, where the value comes from the business resource groups is the time that people put into them. Um, and that, if anything, I think is going to, you know, ha has been increasing um, over, over the last couple of weeks and months. And, and people are getting much more used to having, you know, Zoom meetings and connecting and virtual coffees and things. And, mm -hmm. and, and people are, are, are much more uh, interested in people's well-being and even actually just things like having having these calls and you're seeing someone's you know back bedroom and you're having they're getting to know people a little bit more yeah. and the dog comes in and you know it, it's those kind of human connections which I think really help in terms of um, you know like I say getting to know people and, and people's personal circumstances and things as well which are impacting on the the time that they can can work um, so I think I think you know, on the face of it, it looks like, you know, budgets are being cut, but I think actually if you look a little bit deeper than that, it, it, um, um, people are connecting more on a kind of human level. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think when we take a step back, hopefully when all, you know, when we're back to more normal times, um, and we talked um, at the World Economic Forum, we talked about the diffusion of empathy and economics when we were talking about um, um, women in particular, but, but diversity and inclusion in general. And I think that's one of the things that's going to come out of this crisis is actually thinking about, um, um, you know, the, the human side of things mm -hmm. as, 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 and how that impacts on the economic side of things and hopefully they, you know, those sort of things coming together. Arlene. Oh, I, <laughs> you know, I, I, the one thing that I feel that we've built through this whole situation is you know you take if you you take community away from people and we've realized how much we crave it right mm. and we've realized how much we crave that connectivity yeah. um yeah i mean aren't we all just absolutely looking forward to pride now whenever <laughs> it happens you know what i mean i I'm mean still my next question. <laughs> right, sorry i just think it's going to be this huge celebration of community and for me personally it's going to be really important to harness that energy that we'll all experience when we come back to normal we're able to actually sit in the same room with each other or go for dinner or go to the pub or whatever it is that we choose to do and um, i think it's really important that we don't miss that opportunity because i feel like there is a huge opportunity for you know now 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 community has been taken away from you 
okay so here's here's the place where you can absolutely be part of a community and i feel like I feel like that's going to be quite magnetic. I really do. I'm really looking forward to one massive party coming out of this. I really am. And uh, I, I fear for our liver, is all I'd say. I think um, building on what um, Arlene said, that uh, after lockdown, a lot of people are going to be so desperate to make face to face connections and um, meet up with friends and. I really think that that's going to mean that the, the, the LGBTQI networks themselves will just continue to stay strong because I think there's been, particularly on the, um, it, within um, Deloitte, there's been a lot of emphasis on uh, people's well-being and making sure that um, as not just as networks, but um, as project teams, as um, team leads, that you're checking in with um, everyone because of such a challenging period of time that we're in and I think that's really just brought out some um some really um some fun times I think uh, I think it was was it last week we were we did a would I lie to you session and everyone bought two truths and a and a lie so um I think things like that are are just um I think so amazing and as we I think as we kind of get out of it that it's like you said. I can't. I can't wait for the for the for the party. It's going to be really amazing. And I think in terms of if it will take a backseat, I don't think organisations can afford that because LG, um, LGBT equality is so important to um, LGBT people, and if inevitably it's going to impact people's well-being, and that's the most important thing. So um, I think from from my perspective, it's something that just can't be ignored. And pre or post COVID nineteen that it's so important and it's something that we'll just and um, so as uh, speaking from like a Deloitte perspective anyway that we're just looking to continue to uh, push with what we had planned to do as much as possible and see what new elements we can bring in within the situation and just continue to bring that to leadership and continue to you know try and get those things to be amplified. Fantastic Annie. Um, so in circumstances like these, I think it's a time when we look for community and when networks strengthen. I mean, just looking mm. over, you know, over the past few weeks that we've been in lockdown, the uh, membership of Spectrum has risen un in an unprecedented way because people are looking to be part of a community. Um, and what we've been trying to look at is how do we... Um, get the events that we were planning to do, the things we were planning to do, and how do we make them virtual? So, you know, the pub visit, how do we make that virtual? Yeah. <laughs> the, the chats that we're going to do, how do we do that virtually? Mm. And it's working really well. Um, and I think as long as you continue to engage and you just don't go quiet, mm. people will know <laughs> that you're still going ahead and this is still important. Mm. Um, and like everyone else, we can't wait until whenever this blows over and we have a, an amazing celebration. Um, but this isn't going to stop us. Um, we just have to think um, around the problems. Um, it's, it's not a, a hindrance in any way. Um, TJ. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's completely natural that the majority of people's focus right now will be on, you know, how, how are we going to respond and adapt to this, new world that COVID-19 is, is presenting us with. Um, but, you know, we're, we're community leaders. Um, that's, that's what we do in our networks. We're, we're trying to, to help build and lead that community. And our job has always been to, to lift up the voices um, of people within our community and to find ways to connect people so we don't feel so alone. Um, so that, that job hasn't changed. Um, and I don't think it will change. You know, it may not be face to face for now, but you know, as as Annie said, we're we're finding ways to do those things digitally, um, and this is you know this is giving us the impetus to do that. Um, I think you know the the thing that we need to make sure that we're we're considering is that some of the changes that that this pandemic and lockdown have really brought to light is that you know it's easy to easy it's it's. It's one thing to be yourself and be completely out at work, um, but there are, you know, there are a population of people within our community who, 
you know, they're locked down at the moment and perhaps they aren't out at home. Mm-hmm. Perhaps they, mm-hmm. you know, they're living with people who aren't mm-hmm. as receptive to, to their life um, as they'd like it to be. So, mm-hmm. you know, there, there are some difficulties out there that I think are, can, you know, can be quite unique to our community. And it's our job to make sure that, that we find ways to tackle those or at the mm-hmm. very least be an open ear for people to talk to so that they don't feel alone. And that, that's never going to change. You know, that job's always yeah. going to be there. I think, you know, you're, just literally pulling the question out of my head, you know, when we think about, uh, you know, when you, when you said this, you know, in everything that we do, whether we are part of an LGBTQI network, whether we work for community groups, obviously for myself, you know, I, I volunteer as part of the core team for UK Black Pride, amongst a few other initiatives. And so it is that sense of, you know, all of us have been gearing up, whether within business or outside or duly for prides, many of which around the country have been postponed or cancelled. You know, when we when we look to the activations that businesses would start to do, whether, you know, you were getting ready to march or you were going to have a stall, um, that, again, doesn't go away. We are LGBTQI 365 days of the year. You know, how are in a in a two point question, how are your businesses still looking to do any pride activation? And obviously from a UK Black Pride perspective, we're looking at what we can do virtually. We have a team meeting tomorrow, so I'm really excited by you know what some of the ideas that the team have come up with to try and create and create that space because like you said, TJ, you know, for for, for many of us, we have different circumstances to the entire community with which we serve. And when I say that I'm speaking specifically to you know LGBT to youth homeless who right now you know is a is a massive is a massive group that we're really concerned about those people culturally who can be out of the workplace but actually at home for cultural reasons for simply it's not safe you know you're in environments where we're in lockdown we're not necessarily the people that we want to be in lockdown with and so it's it's that added extra measure on safety and some of Or, you know, some of these people are employees within our business. Some of these people are people that we actually work with, but might not necessarily realize. And on that one day that they get to come and celebrate for a pride, for a pride celebration, we we uplift them in as many different ways that that we can. We create that safe space. So how within businesses are we thinking about trying to further create that safe space for people, even if it's just digitally? and, And are your businesses thinking about doing that? And if not, can we share some best practice from from some people that are, you know, I, I hear about some of the virtual activations that you're doing at GSK. You know, I know that you know offline some of us are having all conversations about, you know, what does what does Pride now look like moving forward, recognizing that for many it is still a party of the celebration and I'm desperately looking forward to being together with my collective UK Black Pride family, but knowing that it's also for many still a protest and still a conversation that needs to be had. So, you know, how are we as collective leaders in the different organisations that we serve tackling that? And, you know, whoever would like to answer that first, please go ahead. Okay, Arlene, I'm picking you. (laughs) That's so rude. (laughs) I wanted to hear what everybody else was going to say. Gosh. Um, so look, as far as plans for, you know, Pride and everything else, nothing is cancelled in our view. Nothing mm-hmm. is off the table. We also partnered this year with AKT uh, mm-hmm. because the whole kind of, you know, that, that homelessness and as you said, people who are n- not necessarily in lockdown with people they want to be in lockdown with. Um, so we're continuing to look at events and things that we can run to raise some money. Mm-hmm. We do want to use Pride as a, as a way to raise money for AKT. Um, so, you know, but very much we're still reaching out. We're, we're really good at virtual drinks <laughs> and we're really, we do a lot of that. We actually do, you can see a lot of musical instruments behind me. So we, we do little online gigs for each other and things oh, like that. Yeah. And, yeah. um, you know, and that's, again, we're not necessarily doing an LGBT plus thing. We're just inviting people along. Mm-hmm. Um, again, not really having that concept necessarily of, um, membership as such but uh, our team's channel is busy you know and we're you know continuing to reach out to people and then just directly you know people who I know have struggled in the past we're just staying in touch and emailing and you know having a virtual coffee or a virtual glass of wine if it's after 3 30 you know <laughs> later and um, so yeah I mean you know it's all channels open wide yeah. wide open but as far as 
as far as um, you know, everything that, that we had planned to do this year, we will do or we will do next year whenever we're ready to, to get on with that. Absolutely. No, no changes for us at all. Fantastic. Annie, you mentioned, you know, GSK is pulling ahead with all of their ideas. You know, are you pride planning still? We yeah. are. Yeah, we're we're pride planning. Nothing is cancelled. Nothing is off the table. Mm. Um, generally, we tend to kick off pride with a flash mob. <laughs> um, at our headquarters so we're working out how to do that virtually because it has to be done um okay. so, it's tradition uh, i'm hearing it's tradition <laughs> and everyone still wants to do it because we like a good dance um and regarding kind of yes you would normally be in the pride um uh, march we take part as part of the proud science alliance mm -hmm. with the other lgbt networks from the health and life sciences um area and we are looking at how we can um basically make it bigger than GSK. So whatever we do virtually, how can we bring all those other companies together and do something massive and uh, wow. make those connections, whether that's through kind of like coffee roulette meetings, mm -hmm. having virtual um, kind of tea and coffee and wine and everything else going on, mm -hmm. um, or telling stories of kind of scientists um, through history and scientists that we know of who are LGBT and working to help fight COVID. So mm -hmm. nothing's off the table at the moment. We are exploring and we are determined to celebrate. Fantastic. Tolly, you mentioned obviously, you know, the activations and, you know, slightly off topic, I've seen the emails and the conversation and engagement, you know, between Delight and wanting to be part of UK Black Pride this year. You know, when you're looking at the Pride activations that you're doing within your business, again, are they full steam ahead, still having those conversations? And, you know, what's the plan to be bigger and better for, you know, 2020 and beyond? I think for us in the similar way that it is still full steam ahead and uh, we've actually uh, that there have been quite a few emails um, going into my inbox this morning with different ideas about what we can do and how we can virtually um, still have um, the pride events that we wanted to have um, through Globe and looking at because at the uh, Globe is very UK focused looking at more could we do some some sort of global event as well and bringing some of the other member firms in and looking how we can uh, bring in um, our senior partner into those as well um, as he's obviously a very big supporter of the event and was in the parade with us spraying his hair green last year <laughs> <laughs> having a fantastic time um, so uh, we're looking at um, sort of different ways about how we can still um, get that message across virtually and um, still have those events but also I think still because um, I think there's an there's been I'm sure everyone has been in many zoom meetings and so on then not to have um, some zoom fatigue to make sure we keep mm. the events you know fun and also um, keep keeping them at a good level so that people are you know um, really wanting to engage with it so definitely um, nothing's stopping but we're just looking at how we're going to really um, you know do that over the pride months Fantastic. TJ, what are they doing at Santander? Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> exclusive. I felt like this was going to be an exclusive. <laughs> I know, right? Um, and nothing's off the table. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to, like everybody else, we're trying to, you know, figure out how we're going to do this in a, you know, very likely a digital, a digital summer and a digital fall, perhaps. Um, and how we can, you know, bring that to, to our members and, and really, you know, shout out what's happening and, and lift people up with that. Um, you know, we, it's not, we may not physically be there marching down the street um, like we normally do. And that's a disappointment because I love it. Um, <laughs> chance to get my legs out and get some reflective blue off of me and, and maybe, you know, get a bit of color. But um yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to find our way through of, of how we're going to do it, but absolutely nothing is off the table. Um, uh, there'd be a riot if we cancelled Pride, honestly, there'd be a riot. <laughs> and Claire, what, what, you know, I know you said budgets are changing at Mercer, but I, I, I get the impression from this very phenomenal group of women that, you know, if you, if you want to get something done, you can get that done. Yeah, exactly. We we have we have central budgets, but you know we have we have other budgets that you can uh, that you can tap into. Um, yeah, I mean we um, 
so we have uh, June as kind of Pride Month at Mercer. Um, so each of the different business resource groups have a kind of month throughout the year, and, and June obviously to coincide with most Pride parades is, is Pride Month. And actually, you know, the biggest part for that, from my perspective, was having um, you know a global kind of um, email and um, LinkedIn posts, etc., from our senior leaders giving their support to the LGBT community at Mercer. Um, which has the advantage of being free <laughs> and, of, and and something that we can do, um, you know, whether we're in lockdown or not. So that that's still very much happening. Um, and one of the other key things that we're doing for Pride Month as well is a is a almost a kind of a little bit of a training session for for the country leaders around LGBT identities and some of the challenges in different countries, etc. And you know what they can do to support their LGBT communities. So again, that's very much happening. Um, and, then, and then like everyone else um, in our different locations, you know, looking at, at what we can do for, um, you know, because obviously we're not going to be going on on pride parades and things. And I'm encouraging everyone. I've got my rainbow behind me, um, which I, which I, I, you know, is NHS slash pride thing I've decided. Um, uh, and you know, encouraging everyone to wear their pride t-shirts and that sort of thing when they're on, you know. And, and I think that, I mean, last year we, we did a, um, a campaign which was just for people to put their pronouns and their pride logo on their emails um, and I do that you know I used to do it, only do it internally and I do it externally now as well and it's interesting that the amount of clients who've got in touch with me and said oh I see you're part of the network you know can I get you in touch with this person or that person we're really interested in talking about what you've been doing um, and making those connections and actually it's been it's been a massive positive so um, yeah I think there's lots there's lots that we can do which may even be more productive than rocking up to a, <laughs> to, a to a party in a park. I, you know, I, I think that it's really encouraging and I know kind of just listening to the five of you and the different things, but, but hearing that, you know, determination, that motivation, that, you know, pride preparation is not going to stop. And, and I think that that's, you know, as community people, that's a real concern, you know, by our people that the way that they, they had wished to celebrate is changing, but will they still get to celebrate, you know, and we see that, you know, certain uh, prides around the country are no longer going to carry on. But, you know, the fact that all of your businesses are full steam ahead, you know, and, and some of the powerful women behind that are saying, no, definitely full steam ahead. Um, it's fantastic. You know, this has been uh, such a lovely time to speak with you. And so for our last question, I thought we'd just have a little bit of fun. If you had to choose anyone to isolate with in lockdown, I should say, aside from your partners, if you have one, who would it be um, and possibly why? And whoever would like to go first, please, um, you know, share. Annie, I can see, do you look ready? I guess I'm ready. Um, so I do have a lovely partner who I live with and it's been great kind of being able to spend time with her, but, um, I guess for me, someone that's really inspired me over the last year has been uh, Charlie Martin, who's yep. a British um, transgender racing driver. She came yeah, to GSK awesome. yeah. house last year and spoke to our network and our leaders uh, around her trans journey. And I was just so inspired with uh, what she's done, what she's achieving and how she's um, especially when she was coming out, she was able to share that journey on YouTube, which must have been a help for so many people. And she just really uses her uh, mantle as a sports kind of star of such to help raise awareness of, of great charities like Mermaids. Um, and she goes around, uh, you know, speaking at, at, at length to companies and kind of raising issues of trans visibility and um i think she would be amazing and an instagram post to say that show that she's having such a great time in lockdown i think i'd like to join her <laughs> yeah i think i saw she had uh recently done her first track race um so it looked yeah that looked really phenomenal so yeah that's a that's that's a great pick uh okay i'm gonna go to tolu who was who would be your pick Apart from possibly your partner. Yeah, I'd say obviously my partner, number one. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's great. It's been great in lockdown because uh, I think for us, we're usually both really busy and traveling. So we were saying that this is that it feels like the longest we've spent together that's not been on holiday for a continuous period of time for a while. So that's that's been really good. But for me, 
I'm a really big fan of Kalechi Okafor and the Say Your Mind podcast. I think she's amazing and she's a great ally and a, and just a real champion for black women. And I love her. She's amazing. Yeah. If you don't listen to her podcast, listen to it. <laughs> Absolutely. On a Monday, that podcast is yeah. yeah. my best line. Yes, yes, that's right. So I, I thought it would be so much fun uh, just to like hang out and just have some like really awesome discussions. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I'm madly looking at her Instagram, just <laughs> all the food that she's been making recently. I'm like, yeah, yeah. hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Claire, who would you be in isolation with? Oh, you see, everyone's been really worthy. <laughs> <laughs> But I, my um, my favourite person who I who I admire most in the world is Dolly Parton. So that's oh, my cool. Pick. And Dolly Parton. <laughs> TJ's like, damn it, I should have picked her. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the podcast Dolly Parton's Dolly Parton's America is is amazing. She's just, I mean, proper self made woman, and you know, really, um, you know, taking some really brave decisions, I think, and really stuck to her principles. I think she's great. Fantastic, Arlene. <laughs> who would be your lockdown pick? Can I say the other 99 women that were on that list? <laughs> Eating, you only get it's one. me to one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, look, just because you know me, I'm all about the laughter. I think, I think, I love Miriam Margulies. I think she's hilarious. And, you know, somebody I definitely wanted a dinner party, but... Um, yeah, I think we'd, we'd have, and I do, just to say, to follow the trend, I have a partner. I have an 11-year-old <laughs> daughter. Um, so it's been great being with them because we'll never get family time like this again, ever, ever, ever. As a matter of fact, I'm surprised one of them hasn't uh, come through the door yet. But um, so, yeah, so, so certainly somebody like that, somebody who's going to really make me, you know, make me laugh in these times because that's really, keeping spirits up, I think, is really important. Absolutely. Finally, TJ, who would be your lockdown pick? Apart well, from apart part. from Dolly Parton, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm clearly a super serious person. I never laugh or tell jokes. Um, I think I think my first pick um, would be my best friend Wayne. Um, however, he lived with us a while ago, um, and I think our prank war was actually responsible for my wife's last brown hair turning gray. So I think in homage to, to not making all of my wife's hair fall out, I'd probably go with Sue Perkins because we both think she's absolutely hilarious. And if anything, I just, I just want to laugh through the lockdown. So if I could do that with Sue Perkins, I'd be all right. Absolutely. I mean, this has been uh, so much fun. Um, I'm going to reserve the right to not have a pick because I think I have so many um, and some of them I've, you know, I've, I've, I've met and been really fortunate, you know, I, apart from kind of uh, family, you know, I would, obviously I, I have to say Lady Phil and I would, you know, she was one of my dearest friends and I'd love to kind of be in her company. Uh, my friend Amber Hikes, you know, there are uh, so many collectively. I think I will, I'll say my entire UK Black Pride family because it is just UK Black Pride and that's, that's I'm sticking with it and, and that's what I'm going to say. Um, but again, thank you uh, for being with us today and giving up your time. Uh, you know, thank you for joining us on the inaugural Lesbian Visibility Week. Uh, thank you for being out at work. You know, it's because of people like you that more and more women feel able to come out and be open about who they are. Um, and so, you know, we really do thank you um, for sharing, you know, some really amazing tips, your journeys, your stories. Um, you know, I, I think I could speak for everybody who is watching. This has been incredibly powerful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Also, Thanks. you know, I, I wish you stay safe, um, you know, and hopefully, you know, in the coming months, we will be together again soon. I'm looking forward to all of your celebrations. You know, I'm hoping for an invite for all of them. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Be, You're all invited. Yes. We're going to have a party. <laughs> absolutely. You know, it'll, be, it'll be great um, to share best practice together. So wishing you all the best. Bye.